All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Bajeska Simpkins School of Human Rights. Of course, on Saturday, we had our orientation, and today we have class one. And for those of you new to the Simpkins School of Human Rights, um, I just want to point out that every class will begin with some sort of film clip or song or something that will get us in the mood for that particular evening's lesson. And tonight, we are honored and pleased to welcome a special guest to our class as well, and to really dive deeply into some of these historical themes of both indigenous histories and African histories that are so integral to life in South Carolina today. But before we get into that, um, I think Brett has a few words for us as well. Is that right? Well, Dr. Green, we want to recognize the people that didn't get recognized. We'll do that later. I'll leave that up to you. So let's go ahead Sorry. and do so now. Um, so, of course, we had our orientation on Saturday, but what we like to do is, if you were not able to make it to our orientation this past Saturday, um, first off, for those who are in the room with us physically, if you could introduce yourselves with your name, uh, where you're from, and why you're taking the Majeska Simpkin School in 2024, we would greatly appreciate it. Is there anyone in the room right now who wasn't here on Saturday? Oh. Okay, we've got a handful of folks. All right, sir, please go ahead first. Uh, I'm Hal Stallworth, and uh, I grew up here. I uh, was away from my 20s, came back, and um, I, I'd known about Majestic Symptoms, but I had not known about the school. So uh, Naloka turned it on for me, and here I am. Fantastic. Very good. And we're glad to have you here this evening. All right, and I saw two women had their hands up in the back as well. Um, either one can go first. Um, I'm Lauren Donahue. I'm from Greenville. I'm here in my 20s. And <laughs> I'm here just to figure out how to be an active member of the community. My name is Annie Mahaffey, and I have lived here just for my whole adult life. And also just want to learn how to be plugged in um, to the Columbia community as well. Fantastic. That's great to hear. Again, welcome to this year's session of the Majeska Simpkins School for Human Rights. All right. Say Abba Sadiq has walked in. She's an alumna coming back for more. <laughs> All right. Excellent. Excellent. And, and also, um, anyone on Zoom who was not here on Saturday, um, trying to see if there's anybody I read. Melissa Reyes, please go ahead. Introduce yourself. Yeah, unmute yourself, please. Yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Melissa Reyes. I am an organizer, a labor organizer with the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, and I cover North and South Carolina. Um, recently, I was involved in an organizing campaign with Westinghouse out in Hopkins, South Carolina. We had the election over the weekend and lost, unfortunately. 246 to 379. And so, you know, again, I'm from Charlotte and the organizing campaign brought me to Columbia, South Carolina, and I got to meet Brett Bercy at the Progressive Network. And, um, you know, I took their words seriously in the, you know, advertising of the class that, you know, if you want to organize in South Carolina, you have to learn the history and, you know, go through this program. And so I'm just doing my due diligence and, you know, trying to learn as much as I can. All right. Welcome again, Melissa, to the Majeska Simpkins School of Human Rights. Up next, uh, Cora Webb, please introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. I use any pronouns. I um, also spent my childhood in Columbia, South Carolina. I spent most of my adulthood in Charleston, South Carolina, and I have family scattered around the South. And so I thought this would be a good supplemental education um, to the organizing work I'm invested in now. Also, um, for many people, um, my education was a little scattered. I felt like it did not go that in depth, even in college of Black history, it's specifically Charlestonian history or like Columbia, Columbia Black people history. And so I thought this was a great um, add-on to other things I've learned. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us, Cora. Okay, uh, Kevin Holman, please go ahead. <laughs> 
Hi, um, my name is Kevin Holman. Uh, I moved to Beaufort, South Carolina, um, gosh, uh, when I was in fifth grade. So uh, I've been down here. I just recently, I worked at the Black Chamber of Commerce for about five years where I moved back home um, and started my family. But I also now work at Penn Center, uh, which is the first school in the South for emancipated slaves. So a lot of this hits home for us and me, uh, especially the untold history and the truths and, you know, being able to speak on it um, from a from a good point of view and being, you know, being able to talk to it. Um, so this will help me in forming our relationships uh, where I work at um, as for and also bettering myself. Fantastic. And again, welcome to the Jessica Simpkins School of Human Rights, Kevin. Um, is there anyone else on Zoom? That room with people in it is the, is, um, the Charleston the class. Charleston group. That's, that's, uh, yeah, so the folks in the Charleston classroom, would you please unmute yourselves and introduce yourselves to the audience? Hey there, yeah, there's a handful of us at the Charleston Worker Center. Um, I'll go first. My name is Alfred. I organize with the Charleston Democratic Socialists of America, as well as the Solidarity Network for the Low Country Action Committee. And both those orgs put a premium on political education. So that's why I'm super excited to be here. Uh, I'm Ivy Schieffer. I organize with the uh, Charleston Alliance for Fair Employment. I'm a Starbucks worker, and I thought that it would be helpful to have more understanding of South Carolina's political history in the work that I do. Uh, my name is Eric. I'm originally from Charlotte, North Carolina, but I am in Charleston now. And uh, I just want to further my own political education, especially when it comes to Indigenous and African American histories in South Carolina. Uh, my name is Tyler. I do stuff with uh, uh, local DSA and more recently Free Palestine in Charleston here. And uh, was born in Irmo, raised mostly here in Charleston. Uh, just a good learning opportunity, it looks like. Yeah, that's wonderful. Again, we're so happy to have folks coming to us live from Charleston. Uh, and again, this is sort of our, our way of experimenting with Zoom and using these tools to really bring the Majesta School to more people across the state. Is there anyone else on Zoom who was not here Saturday before we move on? Anybody else? Charlotte Martin, could you please introduce yourself as well? Hey, y'all. Um, I'm Charlotte Martin. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I am um, an organizer for the South Carolina Progressive Network. Um, as well as South Carolina United and South Carolina Housing Justice Network. Um, I am here because I want to be the best kind of organizer I can be. Um, I think it's really important to not let history repeat itself, but I think we're dangerously close um, to something like that. So I am here and ready to soak up all of this information um, I, the reading, I, I'm so ready. I, I'm pumped. Thanks, y'all. Oh, that's great. That's wonderful. I'm always, always glad to hear students have already done the reading. That's, <laughs> that makes my day every single time. Okay, so, um, anybody else you see you can introduce or? Okay, so let's go ahead and move on. Brett, did you have anything to add? No, I want to introduce Brett since I said that to know. Oh, sure, go ahead. Thank you. So Brent's going to come up now and introduce our guest speaker for the evening and also say a few words about the video we viewed at the start of class this evening. Thank you, Ellie. So that fellow that was reading that poem, a man named John Trudell, and I get emotional every time I think about John and talk about John, and I never got to meet him, but we were running in the same circles, and he's two years older than I am. It was... Um, I've made births of Sioux, Sioux Lakota, which I don't know what that is. It's, it's I mean, there's so many people in the Midwest now that have multiple tribal relationships. But he was definitely a native who was raised and and uh, with a native father and uh, married a native woman. Um, joined the Navy when he was 17, dropped out of school for a few years uh, during the Vietnam era, and I kind of got up with him when he was the spokesperson for the takeover, the occupation of Alcatraz in 1969. 
And that lasted for nearly three years. And 68 and 69, I was organizing for the Southern Student Organizing Committee and SCFs. And so that was, you know, real squarely on my radar screen because the understanding that people were developing, like, like myself, that what was going on in Vietnam was not much different than what happened to the Native Americans or what was happening in our own communities of color. The kind of colonialism by some people, imperialism by others, and just how did our oil get under your sand by other people, driven by people that Trudell has this line in that poem that you just heard, the predators came to civilize us. Think about it. The predators came to civilize us. I heard our vice president today talking, calling for an immediate ceasefire. And then I heard a commentator on NPR talking about, it wasn't a commentator, it was somebody from over there talking about how the bombs that the Israelis were dropping on Gaza today were given to them by the United States government. The predators are coming to civilize. <laughs> At some point, people have to figure out there's got to be a way to stop the predation by figuring out other ways to do it than using the tools of the master to dissemble the master's house. And that's what the Majestic School is about, is learning ways to be able to speak in a language that can be heard and understood and to be able to have strength and power and energy from doing what it is that sets us free. And Trudell went on to be the spokesperson for the American Indian Movement uh, after Wounded Knee. Wounded Knee in 19... What year was that, John? Uh, Chris, 1971? 71, And that... Um, I had friends that wounded me, and that was quite an impactful thing. And that uh, in 79, Trudell uh, had left the aim, and it was a lot of repression after wounded me. And he was burned a flag in front of the FBI headquarters in 1979. The next day, the house that his family lived in on a reservation in. Nevada was burned with his three children, his wife and his mother. Mm -hmm. And he became a poet and musician. And he took up with Jackson Brown about the same time I did. And Jackson worked with us for a number of years. That sign there with Jackson saying some of them were angry at the way the earth was abused by the men who learned how to forge her beauty and the power. That is the same thing that Trudell was speaking of in a different language from a different color person in a different time, but the same thing. And I worked with the, with the natural guard, which you'll, we'll talk about as we get down the road in the Majeska School, was something that came out of growth. And we worked with Jackson Brown and Bonnie Raitt and some other big name people that felt the same way we did and had a series of activities and I was at Grants, New Mexico, working with the Navajos about uranium mining. And I kept missing Trudell. And he died in 19, you know, 2015 of cancer. But he's, there, there's a movie called Trudell that you may get through the library. But he's just somebody that went through the fire with the Native people and came out still respected by all the people he'd worked with. A lot of the people that were in AIM, I was in a, a delegation in 1983. There was an American Indian Treaty organization that was AIM's United Nations chartered organization that had NGO status. And I went to the United Nations in Geneva with an AIM delegation, Russell Meany, the Vernon Belcourt, and those people. Most of them ended up in jail for bar fights. And um, there's a lot of... Anyway, let me just say that Trudell is somebody that... that that came through that fire and was loved by all. And he spoke with his poetry and his music and did a, a magnificent job of carrying on. So I just wanted to pay that respect to him. And I want to bring up my good friend, Chris Judge, who's been digging in the dirt of history for as long as I've known him. And we've another one of us had gray hair. And uh, he is now the associate director of the University of South Carolina Native American Study Center. I got right. And this. A little town in South Carolina called Lawrence, Lancaster. Lancaster. It starts with now. <laughs> Which town is it, Chris? Lancaster. Okay. Come up there, here. There they say Lancaster. <laughs> and so he's going to brief us on um, 
the history of the first people that were here that were uh, and still are abused. And that the, um, I wanted to mention that on the 17th of March, Chris will be here with uh, Terrence, Lilly, Terrence Lilly Literwater, who is the uh, Chief Executive Officer of the South Carolina American Indian Affairs Commission, which is a 501c3 we've been working with for 30 years. Let's hear for Chris Jones. Also, by the way, for the folks on Zoom and also for the folks in the room, um, after Professor Judge is done with this presentation, we'll have some time for Q&A, and then I'll give my presentation on Africa. Uh, but if you're on Zoom especially, uh, feel free to go ahead and type the questions in the chat. Um, I'll keep up with them once we get to that part of the program. But now, ladies and gentlemen, Chris Judd. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Brett. Uh, good to be back here. I think it's my third year in a row. I think Brett forgets because he probably wouldn't ask me back if he remembered. But, um, I'm happy to be here. I'm suffering some sinus stuff with all the pollen that popped out this week, so forgive me for that. Uh, I want to start off by saying I'm a member of the unrecognized Celtic tribe of Ireland. I'm not native. Um, I'm a white guy, uh, but I've been studying Native Americans for a long time. And what I'm going to do in a very brief period of time is go over 19,000 years of Native American history in South Carolina, so we better get started. <laughs> um, 16, apparently. Um, <clears throat> the first people that came to South Carolina did came during the last ice age. We call them Paleo-Indians. Uh, the environment was very different. There were no pine trees in South Carolina, if you can believe that. It's mostly <laughs> hardwoods. There were a lot of animals running around that are now extinct, like mastodon and mammoths, saber-toothed cats, yamas, camels, horses. Uh, giant land tortoises that uh, became extinct. And these folks were highly, highly mobile band level groups of maybe 50 to 150 people, all related by blood or marriage, wandering around the landscape and mobile. They had to move around to go after these herd. These animals were herd animals. They moved around. And so people had to pick up and follow them. Uh, we don't know much about these people except there's 800 of a hyper spear point that occurs that we found around the state. And it looks like they prefer where major creeks hit large rivers. And if you think about it, the rivers in prehistory or pre-contact are the interstate highways. The large creeks are the roads that cross the interstate and have exits. And there, there's motels and a place to eat. And if you've forgotten your toothbrush, you go to the Walgreens. These places were the same kind of place for those people. You might be there one week, I'm there the next week, another group, uh, and then pick up and move on. So that, that's the first step uh, uh, in, our, in our history of Native Americans. Around 10,000 years ago, as you all know, the Ice Age came to an end. We began a period of global, global warming that exists today. And the, the first, the first uh, early archaic for the first few thousand years is a, a reaction to this changing environment, changing climate, changing animals and vegetation. Uh, and people are still hunter-gatherers, mobile. We think they do a seasonal round where they, they go from the mountains to the sea in a given year. Um, spring, where do college students go? <laughs> so, <laughs> go to the beach. You think about it, if you go to, if you, if you go to Charleston now, the azale azaleas are probably blooming. Mm -hmm. They're just starting in my yard. That's why my sinuses are clogged. And in Lancaster, they haven't started yet. So they go down there because the plants are going to appear first. It's warmer there. If you've ever been to John's Island, those tomatoes are the first ones, right? Um, so they go to the coast and they take, take advantage of those resources. Uh, forge around in about a two-hour walk of their base camp. And when they exhaust the resources, they move four hours, start another circle, and then make their way up into the uh, upstate for fall. Early for late summer, for early fall, they're in the Piedmont, uh, gathering uh, nuts or simmons that can become available at that time, and then hunting deer and bear, which are their optimal weight for the year. Uh, and then for winter, they park on the fall line. They park at Camden, Columbia, Augusta, taking advantage of two different areas: coastal plain sandy soils, clay Piedmont soils, and then that whole round starts over again. Uh, in the middle archaic, which is seen we see here. If you can believe this, 
It was much warmer than it is today. Worldwide warming event. Hard to believe after a couple of the summers we've had lately. But what that does is it, it promotes uh, incredible plant growth. Animals that thrive on plants prosper and the people that uh, prosper on both uh, do very well. There's a population explosion, we think. The sites up until now have been along the major rivers, really close. Now sites are everywhere. When people are living in kind of marginal areas, you know, away from major rivers, it's probably because it's crowded at the river. Uh, and so we think that's what's going on in that period. Um, starting about 5,000 years ago, we get a period of, of great innovation. Uh, we have a container revolution. Up until now, there are no fire durable containers. They start to make uh, soapstone bowls out of soft talc rock uh, and pottery vessels. And the thing about these is it tells us what they're eating. You know, my children used to love to call me when I drove in the driveway from my hour trip to Columbia and tell me, can you go to the grocery store? If they ask me to get smart food, you know what smart food is? That cheesy popcorn? I got to get two bags. So I'm eating one on the way home. <laughs> All right. But if they ask me to get brown rice, I only need one bag. One. Yeah, go it's, it's got to simmer for a couple of 45 <laughs> minutes, right? If you do it the right way. My students say, well, now one, one minute in the microwave, but you got to simmer. <laughs> and so containers in the fire are about starchy seeds that people are starting uh, to make use of. And so we have a container revolution. Uh, people move back to the river. Um, and, and this boat, in the photo, I'm using my cursor. Uh, you see this V shaped series of rocks in the river. That's a weir where they've manipulated rocks into a V so they can capture and channel fish into nets. Um, we start to see the first houses. And these houses are semi subterranean, 18 inches dug down into the ground, uh, covered over, uh, probably living seasonally rather than doing this mobile mountains to the sea thing. And then in the, in the fire pit there, you see these disks with holes in them. And these are soapstone disks. They start making these, heating these up, dropping, dropping, dropping them in wooden containers to boil water. And then somebody finally says, let's just make a bowl out of the soap. So that's the late archaic period, lots of innovation. Another thing that we see along our coast, and there's 15 of these, are these large complex of architectural monuments made of shell and garbage. Okay. This is the Fig Island shell ring. The, the Fig Island too, this one here, that's the size of a football field to give you scale, okay? The one next to it, this is 800 feet by 600 feet and 40 feet tall, made of shell and manipulated into these geometric type features. We're not exactly sure what these things are, but they're great time capsules about what's going on for, for environmental reconstruction as well as cultural reconstruction. The shell changes the pH of the soil as the shells dissolve, calcium carbonate in the shell, neutralizes the soil. And so for the first time, we start to see organic artifacts. We start to see bone pins. We start to see uh, projectile points, spear points made out of antler and bone. And the question becomes, have they always had these organic items? Probably. They just rot away in the ground and we don't see them. Uh, sea level rise is taking these sites out at a rapid rate. Uh, when they were built, sea level was about eight feet lower. So they, they were on high ground. They're now in the marsh and are being uh, inundated by the rising sea levels. Uh, of course, the shell rings are probably made from individual family garbage pits made of shell. So here, adjacent to the houses, you've designated an area. And if you're eating a lot of shellfish, you're going to have all kinds of shell. If you ever been to the oyster roast at the end of the night, there's a big pile. Imagine if you're eating that a lot. That accumulates, and then these things are, are brought and built into these large uh, constructs. This gives us a sense that there's some kind of leadership going on. You have to organize, right? Organize work parties, uh, get together, uh, have food available for the people that are working these things. And uh, so there's probably engineers and work parties and to be able to do these things. And the Fig Island one, uh, this one was built over a period of about 500 years. This was in place for about 500 years. The next phase is known as the woodland phase. Uh, it's, it's, it's a phase for the Eastern woodlands. And in a lot of places around the world, people, people by now have long been agricultural. They've been domesticating plants and animals. 
And in the eastern woodlands, the idea is that there's it's so rich in natural resources, there's no need to go to agriculture. Of course, Jared Diamond described agriculture as humanity's greatest mistake, right? Because so much and so much, so many things change. There's more energy, it's harder to do. Um, it's hard on the environment. And so in South Carolina, we don't start agriculture until about 1,200 years ago, where the rest of the world is being, is many places are agriculturalists by this time. Um, the pottery that's developed in the previous late archaic period begins to expand. People begin to settle down, build more substantial structures, and village life begins where they're staying in more, more in one place. Uh, and when you garden, You've got to protect your garden from a lot of things, right? Your neighbors, <laughs> the deer, the turkey, the squirrel, right? So you have to you have to stay in one place. And then when you put it in the storehouse, same thing. You got to protect it from your neighbors and other things that might get in. The final stage in cultural development by Native Americans prior to uh, contact by Europeans uh, is known as the Mississippian period. Uh, it starts out on, near East St. Louis on the Mississippi River. Uh, in Illinois, at a place called Cahokia. Uh, they built a very large earthen mound there, 100 feet tall, uh, sitting on a base of 12 acres. And that starts a new way of life, a new religion, uh, worshiping the sun, uh, a, new, a new way of subsistence, uh, maize agriculture, an exotic introduced from Mesoamerica that uh, provided a staple uh, dietary uh, food for a large population. And so when you move to farming, only a handful of people need to do it and everybody else can do other things. So culture takes off. There's time for specialization. People can be leaders, people can be soldiers, people can be artisans, uh, house builders, potters, all different kinds of things. Um, this shows a village on the, um, on the Savannah River, it was excavated prior to the uh, dam, uh, Richard B. Russell Dam and Lake project in the 80s. Uh, and it was inundated by that. But this is uh, based on the archaeology there. There's no mound there, but this is a large Mississippian village. And these were along the major rivers of the state of South Carolina. Um, the mounds were substructures for buildings, uh, houses for the chief and their associates. Uh, sometimes men, sometimes women were chiefs. Hernando de Soto visited a female chief in Camden in May of 1540. Uh, sometimes there were temples on top of them, and sometimes there were structures that uh, had the bones of deceased ancestors in boxes uh, wait, awaiting a secondary burial later. And then there was the invasion of 1492. Everything changed. Uh, and Europeans started to come to this part of the world in great numbers, and that, as you're well aware, had drastic effects on, on Native American populations. Uh, of course, they go to the Caribbean first. Um, this is a, a priest that was in the Caribbean in the early days after Columbus arrived, uh, and he was complaining in his journal and to the crown back in Spain about the atrocities that the Spanish were inflicting on Native American people, uh, attacking and burning and killing men, women, and children, uh, babies, dismembering them, cutting them up. Uh, and in one particular gross, horrible thing, they would uh, uh, get thir groups of 13 for the apostles and the redeemer, uh, hang them up where their feet were just barely touching the ground and then set them on fire. Uh, and these atrocities were are documented across the Caribbean at this time. Now, while he advocated for Native American people, it was his idea to go to Africa and get slaves. Okay? Of course, Columbus would go home on one of his voyage in chains, but he got his he got out and came back. Now, pretty soon, all the Native people in the Caribbean were either enslaved or dead. And there's some estimates that within a couple of decades that 25,000 Arawak speaking native people would, would, would meet their death. Now we have long considered disease the number one factor, but in some reworking of this, it looks like slavery is probably worse than disease uh, for, for, for doing this. With that said, um, South Carolina 
would come onto the scene as the Spanish decided that they had to go elsewhere to find people to enslave. And one of the first places they went to was uh, South Carolina. Uh, in the 1520s, some Spanish sail into Winyaw Bay at Georgetown. They meet with local Indians. They say their land is called Chicora. Uh, they convince 60 volunteers to get on two ships. My guess is those volunteers had no choice. As they left Winyaw Bay to go back to the Caribbean, one of those ships sank, but one made it. On, that, on the ship that made it was a man that they dubbed Francisco. They gave him a Christian uh, baptism, uh, taught him Spanish, and when they got to the Caribbean, they had him to the point where he could describe his land. And he uh, purported that it was agriculturally rich. And so in 1526, uh, uh, Alion came back, settled a place called San Miguel de la Dolpe. We're not sure where that is. When they sailed back into Winya Bay with Francisco, uh, they met with the people, and soon Francisco was gone. He took off. Um, they did not find agriculturally rich land. If you know the area around Georgetown, very sandy soils. It works with modern fertilizer really well, but to do it in, in the pre-contact area, you'd have to be right in the floodplain. So we think they moved somewhere to the north coast of Georgia with that settlement. It lasted two years. Most of the folks died. I think there were 600 of them to start, um, including Ali on the leader. They had African slaves with them. And interestingly, at one point, they mutinied and went to live with the Indians in the interior. Um, following on this, uh, another expedition that came into South Carolina was the Hernando de Soto expedition. He lands in uh, Tampa Bay uh, in uh, the winter of 1539, has 600 men with him priests, soldiers, diplomats. And they go up to uh, Tallahassee, uh, to the Appalachian town where they winter. And there they find a guy named Juan Ortiz. And guess what? He's not Indian. Uh, he'd been shipwrecked a few years earlier. He knows several languages and becomes an interpreter for them. The Soto's supposed to go to Mexico. He's supposed to find the overland route to Mexico. Uh, find the great river in the interior that would take them to Zacatecas to the silver mines there. And apparently the Spanish geography was very incorrect. They had mapped the coastline very well from their ships, but the interior was completely and utterly unknown. Well, at Appalachia, they meet, they capture two boys who are from Camden. They say they're from Copetacheque, a town in Camden. And the Soto's mission is to find gold and silver find this route to Mexico and bring Christianity to the Indians. He has three charges. Those boys say, if you're looking for gold and silver, you should come to Copetacheque, Camden, South Carolina. It's two days march to the Atlantic Ocean. Well, it's a little longer than that, but it's a lot closer than Mexico. And what's happening is the treasure ships are coming through the Gulf of Mexico. They're going around the tip of Florida. They're coming up the coast of South Carolina to Beaufort. And then they're turning east and going back to Spain, catching those trading. So the coast of South Carolina became a critical point. And if gold and silver was nearby, uh, the soda would be a hero. So he walks, he goes across uh, uh, Georgia. Every major river had one of those Mississippian towns with mounds. And what they really needed, lots of stored food, agricultural products from growing corn and other products. They get to Kofetacheki. They're greeted by the female chief. They go and live in half the houses in the village. So a very large village. And um, when they ask for gold and silver, they are presented copper. Looks like gold to the uninitiated. And mica, which is a mineral from the Appalachian Mountains. It looks like silver. And thus the long U-turn back and trying to get out into Texas. So that mission is a failure. Another expedition in 1566 would leave from the Punta de Santa Elena, the place on the coast where the treasure ships would um, head back. The Spanish established a town there that lasted 21 years, 1566 to 1587. Um, and from there, uh, Juan Pardo and, and troops would go into the interior. A lot of times they were starving there, so the, the general would send them into the interior to, to let them live off the land and find their own food. 
but they were also the fine gold and silver. And they went into the interior. The painting is of a place called Shawara, Morganton, North Carolina. Carter went up there and built a fort. And the idea was the soldiers would amass food that could be brought to Santa Lane to the coast in Cuba. Uh, when he went back 18 months later, uh, the fort, Fort San Juan, the Spanish had built that he had seen with his own eyes, was gone and the soldiers never to be seen again. Now, after that, the Spanish basically stopped exploring South Carolina. And as you all know, in 1670, uh, the British come to Charleston, established Charlestown uh, up on the Ashley River State Historic Site today. And uh, there's a lot of differences in the colonialization by the British than the Spanish or the French before them. First, they stayed. Second, they traded guns to the Indians. The Spanish and French had prohibitions on them. And so that changed the social complexity, the fabric of, of Native Americans. And of course, the uh, the land to the British seemed very good. Henry Woodward, who's an Indian trader, he uh, he was left behind by William Hilton in 1666 amongst the Edison, learned their languages, and then came back with the founding. Um, and he went to Copetacheque, and he said it was just this delicious, pleasant, and fruitful place that if cultivated, doubtless he would prove a second paradise. Uh, within two years of his visit to Copetacheque, which had a thousand people in 1670, was gone. We think part of that is a group of Westo Indians from the Great Lakes who moved down and began enslaving other Native Americans. Um, Charleston was deeded to the, uh, the British in 1675 uh, by uh, the Kusa Indians. This is an interesting document because it, it's signed by a bunch of chiefs, many of whom are women, and conveying uh, 10,000 acres to the British for Lord Ashton. Now, the very first industry in South Carolina was the deer skin and the fur trade. Europe had been depleted of their forests and the animals that live in them had a great need for leather and fur. And so the, the, at first they traded the Indians for food. The British needed the food for the things they had. But eventually that, that, that became uh, mass produced items like glass beads, firearms, textiles, uh, mirrors, scissors, irons, uh, iron objects like uh, hatchets, things like this that were very valuable uh, to the native people. Unfortunately, the people that were willing to go into the back country and trade with Indians were an unscrupulous and uneducated lot who thought they could cheat the Indians. They, they, they didn't realize that the Indians were probably smarter than they were. And so they, they were abusive of the trade, the exchange. They were abusive of, the, they were all men, abusive of the women, native women. And this, this leads to a war in 1715 called the Yamasee War. Now, it's, it's called the Yamasee War, but basically tribes across the uh, southeastern United States participated in this. Due to the uh, traitor abuses, colonial officials sent uh, Thomas Duran and two other traders to Pocatello Town in Jasper County. To their, their intent was to go get the names of the traders that were abusing write the names down, go back to Charleston and call them in and, you know, put them before the court and charge them because this is, you know, this, this cannot go on. The Indians have to be treated right. Um, so Naran does that, they go to sleep and in the middle of the night, they come and get them. The two guys, one, one escapes, one is killed outright. Naran, they, they uh, take fat lighter and pound it into him, set him on fire and he dies a couple of days later. That starts the war. And so they move to Port Royal. They attack the plantations at Port Royal and marched to Charleston. In Walter Edgar's History of South Carolina, he says, never was the colonial enterprise at Charleston ever under a greater threat than on that on the eve of the, of the Yamasee War. Uh, but the militia was called out. Um, and, and very quickly, this insurrection was put down. And uh, by 1717, all, all the uh, episodes of that war would be over. Most of them took place in the southern part of the state, south of Charleston where you have all those Yamasee names like Salkahatchee and Pocatello and Okatee and those kind of places. The result of that war was 
the colonial folks at Charleston no longer wanted Indians going into town. Up until that point, Charleston would have been an incredibly ethnic and racially diverse place. You would have Indians from across the uh, Southeast, different, many different Indian languages. You would have people from across Western Africa and all across Europe living. Uh, but the idea of the natives coming into Charleston after that insurrection uh, bothered them. So they established a series of forts in the interior. One is right here in Casey across the river at Fort Congaree. Uh, there's one Fort Moore, excuse me, on the um, Savannah River near Augusta, but on the South Carolina side, and another one either on the Black or PD River. Uh, and the idea was the natives in the upstate would come there to trade, but not go over to Charleston. And the natives after the Yamasee War were pushed out of the Low Country to the Midlands, and then later they were pushed further out. We get a few glimpses of what life would have been like. Uh, in, in the early 18th century, Philip von Reck uh, made some watercolors in the Savannah drainage. And I like, this is my favorite one because the woman on the left has what looks to be like a bark backpack. She's wearing a European blanket. She has her bow in. The guy in the middle, European blanket, bark backpack, he's got a gourd in his hand, but it's probably holding his black powder for that trade gun he's carrying. So he, had, he has a flintlock. A trade gun. These were uh, today's equivalent would be Walmart. These are cheaply produced. They're designed to fall apart so you go back and buy them. Uh, they didn't want the Indians to have lots of guns, but they wanted them to come back and get the trade. And then the guy on the far right has a European produced uh, those long white killing pipes. Uh, he's got like a raccoon bag. He's wearing a European jacket and silk stockings. And so we start to see the acculturation going on uh, by the 1730s. This is a scene that could have been that early archaic uh, seasonal round up and down 10,000 years ago with a couple of exceptions. See them? Iron kettles, everything. And then the, here's, so there the, here the deer skins laying out. This lady right here is scraping one. So they are preparing skins to take to Charleston and Savannah and trade. The Catawba Nation forms, it's an ethnogenesis at this time. That's an anthropology word for the birth of a culture. Um, in the upstate, where the Catawba, they were not numerous. But what happened was all the low country tribes migrated there. And what we see here, this is the uh, a deerskin map. It was drawn on a deerskin by a Catawba headman and presented to Francis Nicholson, who was a colonial governor in 1721. And Nassau town is where the Catawba chief was. And it's really interesting how he saw his world, his social landscape. All of those groups must go to his village prior to going to Charleston on the left or Virginia on the bottom right, which were the two British centers of trade. The Chickasaw and the Cherokee could go around. They were, they were, they were every bit as big, maybe bigger and more powerful than the South. They could go around to get the trade. What we see is they're living in their villages. The Watery, the Shiraz, uh, the, the Yamasee all have villages in the Catawba Nation. They're very close together, but they're they're trying to maintain their ethnic group, their own people, their own chiefs, and, and their own languages. In 1730s, Governor Glenn goes there. He says there's 25 dialects spoken in the Catawba Nation. So that gives you a sense of this coming together of a lot of different people. Um, the Slave Code of 1740, we think of that as, as being for Native, for, for African Americans. But what you have to realize, uh, at the point of the Yamasee War in 1715, one third of enslaved people in South Carolina were Native. And this, this had a lot of effect on uh, on, on Native Americans. Of course, they were uh, absolute slaves. Um, they were not allowed to practice their own cultures. Uh, they were not allowed to do music. They were not allowed to organize on Saturday nights. Uh, they were not allowed to grow their own food. And they were not allowed to read and write. Without, without your language, your culture is going to go away pretty quick. The language is just so key to that. So that, that was a real uh, a real concern. Uh, you know, uh, in South Carolina governor, 
He says, you know, the safety of the province depends on peaceful relations with the Native Americans, but he couldn't get that across to everybody. And so the Catawba Nation forms out of this uh, uh, diaspora of the dissolving of the Low Country Trail. Now, interestingly, the Catawba quickly sided with the British in the Yamasee War, and they have fought in every war since that time. Proud, proud. Uh, military service uh, to this day amongst Native Americans. It's just kind of weird, you know, that they would have that patriotism for their country, for a country that doesn't always treat them the way they should. Now, a lot of Native American people in South Carolina will tell you that their, their erasure begins in 1790 when they no longer enumerate Native Americans on the census. If they're put in as free people of color, they're put in as uh, mulatto, but the word Indian is not used uh, until 1900, which I'll come back to in a little bit. Um, Andrew Jackson is not very well thought of by Native Americans. They have a park seven miles from the Native American Study Center. He didn't think they were intelligent. He didn't think they were industrious. He didn't think they had morals. Uh, and he thought of them as a, a, a less than uh, an inferior race in the midst of a superior race uh, and had many of them removed. Now the Catawbas somehow survived, not sure if that's because of their proximity to his birthplace or what, but, or maybe they were just too small in number to have been re removed. This is a Catawba woman in 1909 making pottery. This is, um, these photographs are in the, in the uh, Library of Congress. Shows a family we'll call, what they call Somerville Indians. Uh, there's a group of Wasmasaw still living in this area today, and the house and the, the clothing would have been like, like any other poor white or black family, but these, these are what they call a very derogatory name. The, the caption for these are brass ankles. Now, there are survivors to this day. Uh, there are eight state-recognized tribes. These are three of the chiefs, Santee, PD, and Edisto. Um, the Edisto chief is a reverend, a medical doctor, and an Indian chief. Um, so they're often mistreated today. Uh, a lot of them still struggle with prejudice, with finding jobs, even being recognized as native. It is very difficult. Um, of course, school education was a big problem. And as you all know, there were black and white schools in South Carolina, which you might not know, there were also Indian schools because the, the blacks and the whites didn't want them in their schools. So there had to be a third set of schools. And even after uh, uh, integration, a couple of Catawba that were old told me that the buses started to pick up the black kids, but not the Indian. So that, that survives on this, this school. I thought this is really interesting. Over in Dillon County, uh, Lumbee by the name of James Brayboy, he was the principal, the teacher, the bus driver, and the custodian for like decades. Ran, ran old Indian school. There's a process now in South Carolina to uh, recognize tribes. They ask for a hundred year history of groups that have been denied that history. It's, it's often very hard to put these kind of things together. This is through the state's Commission for Minority Affairs, who has a Native American section. Uh, and there's a whole series of conditions that you that you must meet. There are a number of tribes in South Carolina that have not gotten this recognition. And for those who have, you gain nothing. There are no, there's no money, there's no social programs, there's no housing, education, head start, alcohol, drug abuse, there's nothing. At the federal level, they do. And the only one we have are the Catawba. We live in the upstate. So this is a map of the different tribes around the state uh, that are recognized at some level. Uh, by the Commission for Minority Affairs. Uh, a former president, his name will not be over here, he said, you were here long ago before any of us were here, though we have a representative in Congress who they say was here a long time ago. They call her Pocahontas. And so the, the ignorance is everywhere. And one of the things we're trying to do, we're working with teachers, natives, suck on educational television to try to change the standards in K-12 education. And you know what kind of uphill battle we're on with the leader of that agency. It's gonna be very hard to change the standards. I was on the on the committee last time. We made great changes. They went upstairs, they came back, they didn't, they didn't do it. 
Uh, what we're going to do with Indigenous South Carolina Education is we're going to have a website. If teachers want to go to it, we'll have all that information. The Native people in South Carolina tell us our kids don't see themselves in the curriculum. You know, the, and the teachers say, oh, all the Indians are extinct. And kids say, you know, you don't look like an Indian. Where's your headdress? All these kind of things. And so it's, it's an uphill battle to educate people. Uh, the answer what these people, they want jobs, peace, and equality. It's on your T-shirt, isn't it? Uh, I'm with the Native American Studies Center in Lancaster. We're open Tuesday through Saturday, free of charge. Come see us. Our mission is to dispel these, these myths about Native American people to have a place where their, their archives can be had. We have exhibits on them and programs. We have a monthly lunch and learn program, which you can join by Zoom, uh, like we're doing tonight. And uh, taking enough time, I think, all this. So I think I'll stop there and take questions. Question in the chat first. Uh, okay, here we go. So there's, okay, why do you, this is from Sandy Robinson first. Uh, why do you feel that there were numerous tribes of mass territorial areas controlled by women? Oh, yes. It's a matrilineal society. We are bilateral in our in our descendancy, right? We have a father family tree and a mother family tree. They only have the mothers. And so if you've ever heard someone say, I have a Cherokee, Cherokee grandparent, which one is it? It's grandma. So they trade, they trace through the female side. Now the power is often in men. Now the Catawba women that I know say they were never in charge, but all those European guys were men. So we sent the men out to deal with them because we didn't want to deal with them. Um, probably what happened was the male chief died. He did not have a son, but he had a daughter. She became chief, but when she died, her oldest son went back into the male. Any other questions? Yes, go ahead, please. Uh, yeah, I have a question about state recognition. Um, how does South Carolina compare to other states and both in terms of like ease of recognition, but also material reparations or anything like that? I don't know any states that are doing any kind of reparations. In fact, if some Florida just got rid of their program. Mm -hmm. There was a, you might be familiar with the Native American Graves Patriation and American Protection and Repatriation Act. They've redone those, and part of that is is that the federally recognized tribes are indicating that they don't want to have anything to do with what they call hobbies. What they call what? hobbyists. They don't feel like they're real Indians. And so um, we're going to have to push hard for that recognition. There are some, I know, I know some people purport to be Native who are not, and part of it is if you go out and get your DNA done today and you've got Native American, but you weren't raised Native, then they don't accept you. When you were you were raised in another culture, your blood shows now. So, um, uh, and without going too deeply into it, the system here could be better. Yeah. Can you tell us more about the indigenized SC? Is that a C five hundred one C three who started? How long they been around? Uh, we started uh, about four years ago. It was an outcome of a, a, a panel we did on. Uh, we need to get rid of Columbus Day and have Indigenous People Day. Wow. And your buddy Buster Hatcher, chief of the Walker Mall, uh, got with uh, Sarah Rich, who's an uh, archaeologist at Coastal Carolina, and Carolyn Dillon, archaeologist uh, there. And they said, we got to do something. So we formed uh, Native American Studies faculty are on it, uh, members from the different tribes, uh, teachers who can help us understand the, the, the curriculum. The problem with the standards is the teachers have to follow it. Any teachers? It's very narrow. They don't have a lot of flexibility to go outside of the standards. And so uh, unless we can change those standards, it's going to be a tough go. What we're trying to do is say, hey, this little information we have here fits standard 10-A-60, whatever the case may be, and show them, show them how it goes. And so that, that group is doing really good, I think. It's, Hannah, who was in the um, class last time, is a big a principal. In is she still around? Yeah. Why not bring all the subjects? Okay. We got a, another question or two in the chat. Oh, no, right. I'll be all right. Uh, okay, from Gwen Walter. Uh, what changes have been made in recent times to better reconstruct Native American history, especially considering the challenges posed by fragmented and biased historical records? 
That's a loaded one. Um, <laughs> when we first started the center, we brought all the chiefs of the state tribes to the center and we said, what do you want? And they said, tell, tell our true story. You know, listen to us. Don't, don't, don't do what historians have done. This is what we think is going on. Archaeology has a great role to play in that, if I can toot my own horn, and that we can push that back. So with, with me, I feel like I'm working backwards at the same time I'm moving forward. Our historians pick up where the, where the historical record starts. And then we have um, our folklore, Stephen Criswell, is working in Indian communities collecting oral histories. And this is really tough. We went to Orangeburg a few years ago. So the Beaver Creek, we said, they said, we don't want to interview but like the chief, the artisans. And, you know, no offense, but who's the oldest person here? We want to talk to them about, you know. And so they said, we got a 90-year-old woman. She loves to talk. We put her in the chair. We talked to her. After about 40 minutes, my colleague said, you haven't talked about your childhood. Tell us about your childhood. And she said, honey, you know it's coming when they say that. <laughs> honey, I didn't know I was an Indian until I was 80 years old. She told us the community she lived in. It was all Indian then. It's all Indian now. And she went to one of the Indian schools. Her parents had hit it to, to be invisible and to pass in a racist state. And I just want to add to that. I'm, I'm going to, at the end of every class, give a, beat, a brief reading recommendation. And one of the books I brought is uh, called The Rediscovery of America by Ned Blackhawk. Native Peoples and the Unmasking, Unmaking, excuse me, of U.S. History. I'll put it in the chat, make sure folks get it with this week's email. But it's a wonderful book that basically takes history of North America and says, what if you look at it from the point of view of indigenous peoples? And it looks very different than our traditional narrative. Um, let me see. We've got we've got time for um, exactly two more questions that are in the chat, and uh, then we'll move to the Africa presentation. Uh, this is from Jenna Mathel White. I didn't realize there were any Lumbee Indians in South Carolina until your presentation. Uh, my fifth great grandmother was Lumbee from North Carolina. Uh, would you happen to know how many Lumbee Indians are in the state today, and how many there were in the past? Population estimates are very, very difficult to do. Um, the, uh, there is a uh, Sumter tribe of the Shara in Sumter who are related to the Lumbee. The PD groups share lots of surnames and, and family connections. So I'm not sure how many Lumbee are in South Carolina. What I can tell you is that the Lumbee in North Carolina are the largest population east of the Mississippi River. And they are not federally recognized. They're, they put in a, a new petition in 2015 uh, that is still awaiting decision. And perhaps best known for kicking the KKK out of their area back in the 50s. So there's that. Um, and our last question for this part of our presentation is from Dr. Bernie Goldman. Um, I have read so called expert articles that stated that the, I think that's the Lumbee, were a partial African lineage. Would you enlarge on that? Good evening, Dr. Goldman. Um, there's a lot of intermarrying in Native American communities. Uh, it's, it's a shared history. Um, it starts with the, the plantation era when they're enslaved on the plantations together. So the, the Lumbee, uh, some of them might not like to say it, but it, it does appear that uh, what we're doing is we're looking at uh, the, uh, the mixture of the races. And Chris, and they go back to the 1700s with maroonage, with the yeah. enslaved people fleeing into the swamps, yeah. meeting with the Indians who were hiding in the swamps. Indeed. All right, so let's give Professor just another great round of applause. Thank you, um, And I know there was a question in the chat about if these will be available. The presentation will go up uh, on YouTube and be sent out via email later this week. So uh, again, if you miss anything, don't worry, you'll be able to catch up fairly easily. Um, now, what we're going to do is actually move into talking a bit about Africa, uh, and this is where I come in for this evening's presentation. And I want to make clear, too, that when we're talking about Africa, uh, Dr. Bernie Goldman, who just asked a question a moment ago, is giving a multi-part series on African history and civilization uh, that's going to be part of 
um, our Sunday presentations, and I'm going to urge folks, I'm going to really urge people to attend those if you can, because he is one of the foremost experts in the region about the various histories of African civilizations um, in Africa throughout their history. And one of the reasons I'm urging you to do that is, number one, uh, we're going to have our first one of those on March 17th from 6.30 to 8 p.m. I'll come back to that in class today. But secondly, I want to make it clear that my presentation is going to be focused primarily on West Africa. Uh, and it's really a snippet of these, bless you, of these larger histories from the continent of Africa. Uh, and I want to make that very clear because... One of the reasons that we're doing tonight's class the way we're doing it is that it is very easy to start the history of African peoples in the Americas with slavery, right? If you went to, to school, K-12, you're studying American history, peoples of African descent, they'll usually show up until we start talking about slavery. And then the next time they show up, it's maybe the Civil War. Then after that, it's segregation. And after that, everything is okay because we all had a dream. Right. <laughs> but what I think is important to note is that we're talking about West Africa, um, which is the origin point of most peoples of African descent in the United States today. Um, we are talking about a place that at one point contained some of the most powerful empires and tribes in the known world at that time. And so I wanted to spend a bit of time talking about those this evening in the time that I have left. Okay. Now, the thing about West African kingdoms is that while these kingdoms and empires will become the origin places of most people of African descent who are enslaved in the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries, we have to understand what this area of the world was like before enslavement begins. And in, in some ways, we can really do this by looking at four empires, uh, the Ghana Empire, the Mali Empire, the Songhai Empire, and the Jolof or Wolof Empire as well. One of the things we're going to talk about tonight, though, with these empires is, number one, their interactions with each other, and by the end of it, their interactions with Western Europe in particular, especially the Kingdom of Portugal, which we'll talk about in just a second. Now, we're talking about empires in Africa. I want to zoom out from West Africa for a second and give you a sense of what's going on all across the continent. Uh, of course, you have ancient Egypt, uh, just to their south, you have the Kingdom of Kush. Uh, you have Ethiopia to their south as well. Um, I often like talking to my students about Ethiopia because it is one of the oldest kingdoms in the world. Uh, my students, hey, look, it was mentioned in the Bible. That's pretty old. Um, and that's the case with Ethiopia. But in the 20th century, Ethiopia becomes a symbol of resistance to many Black Americans during their war with Italy in the 1930s, just as an example. Um, if you go to the South, of course, you have the Zulu Kingdom and other empires in the South. But our focus is on Western Africa, primarily this area here, and also further than the South, south the Congo Kingdom, part of which is now in present day Angola. Now, Professor Judge mentioned earlier how rivers were an important part of life in North America. The same was certainly true of West Africa. And when we're thinking about the kingdoms of West Africa, we really want to think about trade and who they are trading with. Um, if you look at this map, this is the Ghana Empire, which lasted from about the first, the third century CE. Um, and began in that time period, lasts about 1200 CE. And you see that the red lines are their various trade routes, some going towards the Atlantic coast, some going north to present-day Morocco, some going further east into the interior of Africa. Now, this map I couldn't hear because it's a reminder that for the kingdoms in West Africa, their primary source of income, their primary trading networks are with other African kingdoms. They are aware of peoples in Europe, uh, we'll get to in a second, but for them, they're just a faraway people in a faraway land. They're much more concerned with the peoples in Africa, in North Africa, 
and even going towards what is now referred to as the Middle East, thanks to the spread of Islam from that part of the world into Africa during this time period as well. By the way, that's important because many of the Africans who are enslaved and brought to the Americas, many of them were actually of the Muslim faith, uh, which is again, really important to think about because the enslaved Africans are traditionally portrayed as either not having any religion at all or having you know, uh, traditional <laughs> African faith. Some of them did, but some of them were also Muslim as well. Now, during the era of the uh, Ghana Empire, you do also see the rise of a rival nation in the Mali Empire, uh, which is traditionally seen as being founded by Sundiata Kiata, um, who is considered one of the great heroes of West African history. Now, I mentioned Sundiata because um, his story is also one of the great oral tradition stories of West Africa, the epic of Sundiata. Uh, it's an epic I read when I was in college in an honors world literature course, uh, and it's on par with, say, Beowulf or Hamlet or other epics from around the world. Uh, but in the epic of Sundiata, it actually talks about Mali's culture and how they have these ideas of their culture being really two parts that are, again, weak on their own, but when they come together, they form the part of Mali civilization. So again, a very familiar story of uh, some of the parts being greater than the whole. This is where Mali was. Uh, again, Ghana was a bit further to the south, but the Mali Empire, as you can see, hugs the coastline, and goes into the interior, and includes the cities of Gao and Timbuktu. Um, but again, you notice how the Mali Empire it stretches to include the Niger River. Again, they're using this river as a major trading route, and they're also trading with other empires and civilizations to their north and to their east. Right. So again, this gives you a sense of what these African kingdoms are doing pre-European contact or pre-advanced European contact. Now, if you go on the internet today, um, and if you scour social media, you may at times come across a meme about this show, uh, Musa the First of Mali, who is often referred to as the wealthiest human being. Now, we're not 100% sure about that. Uh, there's some debate about how wealthy he actually was, but we do know he was quite wealthy. Um, and this is because the Mali Empire included within its borders uh, several large-scale gold mines. So, Professor Judge, I think the Spanish may have been better off just going to Mali <laughs> looking for gold than in South Carolina. But um, Mali's wealth and Musa the first wealth was built primarily on trade and especially control of gold in Western and Northern Africa. Now, I mentioned again religion, right? And by this point, most of the citizens of Mali are of the Muslim faith. And so Musa I uh, undertakes a Hajj or pilgrimage to Mecca around 1324. Now, this pilgrimage actually displays just how wealthy Musa I was, because as he and his entourage travel across North Africa to get to what is now um, Saudi Arabia, uh, Musa I, being a charitable man, passes out pieces of gold to people on his trip, just gives them pieces of gold. Says, oh, here's a piece of gold, and God be with you, so on and so forth. Now, this all sounds pretty good, in theory, right? If a guy showed up tomorrow handing out $100 bills in downtown Columbia, I'd probably be there too. The problem was his return trip back to Mali. Musa I had single handedly crashed the economy of North Africa by giving out so much gold. It, it basically made gold worthless throughout the Mediterranean trade. And keep in mind, right, This, it, because it's North Africa, this also involves trade with the trading guilds of Sicily and Italy, parts of Spain. It devastates the entire Mediterranean economy, all because Musa I was a bit too charitable. Uh, so on his return trip back to Mali, he's having to basically trade various goods and trinkets to get the gold back to restore 
the economy of the Mediterranean area, right? Again, this is one man showing how powerful he was inadvertently, uh, but also his power could be derived from trade. And if you look at this image that's behind him, right? So this is Musa the first in the middle of the page, but what you see behind him is actually a large map of North Africa. And the, the lines are trade routes um, from various cities and towns and trading depots in North Africa to other parts of North and West Africa. So again, the peoples of the Ghana Empire and the Mali Empire understood themselves to be living within a much larger trade network. And again, just as Professor Jones was mentioning about uh, the Americas, right? You have these trade networks that exist in North and South America. The same is true of Northern Africa and Western Africa too. Um, the Songhai Empire, of course, would eventually rise, take the place of the Mali Empire. And just like their Mali counterparts, a big part of their power comes from their control of access to rivers, of access to trade routes in Western and Northern Africa. Um, again, this is really important to note because I, I think one of the issues we as historians have with teaching the history of slavery is that even as best as we try to do this, we still have a difficult time of explaining the fact that it's not just that the enslaved Africans have their own cultures or religions or languages. They are already part of nation states. They are already part of these much larger imperial entities. Um, and as we'll see in a moment, those entities initially command a great deal of respect from visiting Europeans. And again, this is another map of trade. This is actually further in the interior of Africa. Uh, you see Timbuktu over here in Gao, those cities over here to the west. This is kind of the at the very heart of Africa and the trade routes going to Egypt, uh, Morocco, and even into Europe and Ethiopia. <laughs> uh, cities like Timbuktu not only become centers of trade, but also centers of learning and education as well. Now, unfortunately, as a child of the 1990s, when I heard Timbuktu, it was usually in a Looney Tunes cartoon, um, but I digress. <laughs> but Timbuktu was a real place, still is, in fact. Um, and it was a place of a great deal of learning. Um, in fact, in recent years, uh, Timbuktu has become known as a place where uh, some of their oldest books and literary treasures have been destroyed. Um, by terrorists, by constant warfare, and those treasures are lost to history permanently. Uh, finally, we have uh, the Wall Empire that's on the coastline of West Africa that also arises concurrently with the Songhai Empire and the Mali Empire as well. But all these empires, uh, they contain various languages, cultural practices, and traditions. They're all trading with each other. They're sometimes fighting with each other as well. Um, but in short, uh, by the time Europeans start to make more and more contact with West Africans, those West African civilizations have had hundreds, if not thousands of years of history already under their belt. Now, again, all the kingdoms I just went through had some similarities. Uh, gold is incredibly important to all of them. Uh, this was especially true of Mali, but the Songhai, Ghana Empire, all of them were able to establish some centers of power based on their access to gold mines and being able to produce gold at an incredible rate. They could control the economy of West Africa because they're controlling gold. The religion of Islam becomes incredibly important to these different civilizations throughout the thousand years we're talking about this evening. And again, as I mentioned before, by the time um, Europeans began to purchase more and more slave Africans and begin to directly intervene in the slave trade, uh, many of those enslaved Africans are actually of the Muslim faith, which will be one of the justifications Europeans will use to enslave them in the first place. And again, the African kingdoms, they're emphasizing trade into Africa. Right, you notice that they were all close on the Atlantic coastline, but for them, they're saying, Well, there's this large ocean out here, 
Um, we don't really know what's beyond it. Let's just trade with the peoples we already know within Africa itself. Now, we do know that some African kingdoms did attempt to send ships out into the Atlantic Ocean. There's even the story that uh, I think it was the Songhai Empire sent this large expedition into the Atlantic Ocean in the 15th century, and it never returned. Um, so they were aware of the Atlantic Ocean, but for them, it, there wasn't really an importance of trying to navigate it because they felt their trade and commerce was with folks to their east or to their north or to their south, areas that could be reached by land. <laughs> But this actually brings me to um, the Congo Kingdom, which again, as I mentioned before, is located in present day Angola. Now, the Congo Kingdom was a little bit different from the other kingdoms we talked about, in that they are one of the first kingdoms that is contacted by the Europeans in the 15th century, in this case, the Portuguese. Now, in our standard U.S. history narrative, and I know this because I teach U.S. history all the time. When we talk about the Portuguese, uh, it's usually only in passing. We talk about the Spanish supporting Columbus in 1492. The Portuguese are, by that point, already selling around Africa to India, and we kind of forget about Portugal after that because all they colonized in the New World was Brazil. But there's a reason for this. By 1492, the Portuguese are heavily invested in trade and commercial relations with African kingdoms, where the Spanish are trying to find a route to Asia. The Portuguese are saying, well, you know what? There is actually a lot of good trading partners to our South in West and Southwest Africa, one of those being the Congo Kingdom. And here's another map of that kingdom. Again, you see on the insert right here, where it is in present day Angola and other parts of Southwest Africa. But the Portuguese, when they first begin dealing with the Congo Kingdom, um, they have to do it with a sense of humility, right? This is actually an artist rendering from that time period of Portuguese sailors approaching the Congo Kingdom's uh, king around the 1470s or so. And you notice the, the sailors and the men here, they are very much in a subservient position. They are offering themselves to the king, offering up the king, to the king what they hope is mercy and tolerance, but they are there to establish trade and diplomatic relationships with the Congo kingdom. Again, this is happening about a decade or two before Christopher Columbus crosses the Atlantic Ocean. And so while in the United States, we obviously focus on Columbus and his voyage across the Atlantic Ocean, it is important to note that by that time, the Portuguese had become more and more invested in trade relationships with Africa, with West Africa in particular. And what you see here on the map are basically the dates of various bases established by Portugal, Spain, and other European powers um, on the African coast in the late 15th and early 16th centuries. Most of these are, are owned by the Portuguese, um, including, of course, Madeira up here in the north. Um, you have Cable Verde right here. Um, you have, oh, Cable Verde right, right here, excuse me. Almina, which becomes a major slave trading post throughout the era of slavery. But so many of these are established by the Portuguese in their attempts to create more relationships with various African kingdoms on the coastline of Africa during this time period. And if you don't believe me when I say that for Portugal, Africa was at the center of their foreign and diplomatic policies in the 16th century, this map in some ways provides further evidence of that. Now, if you look at maps from the 16th and 17th centuries, if you see a map like this, where one part of the map is heavily detailed with beautiful, vibrant colors and, and, and rich detail and, and all of that, that tells you that part of the world is really important to those people. You notice that this map was made in Portugal. 
you look up top, uh, there, there's Portugal and Spain right there, the, the kingdoms of the Iberian Peninsula, and it's kind of just like, yeah, yeah, we know we're there. But you look down at Africa, right? And they're showing you the, the detail of various African kingdoms. If you were to look very closely on the map, you see these lines? Those are actually names of different places on the coastline. They're giving you this rich detail of Western Africa because for the Portuguese, Western Africa was a critical part of their foreign policy uh, endeavors. Now, why am I talking so much about Portugal? What is it about Portugal that makes them a leader in the early age and we refer, refer to as discovery and colonization? Well, in the 14th century, of course, uh, the Black Death, bubonic plague, hits much of Western Europe. By the time it gets to Portugal, uh, the plague has largely worn itself out. Uh, also, Portugal being on the coast of the Iberian Peninsula was really by itself, it was cut off from most of the rest of Europe, so it was able to develop independently of some of these other you know, places. Also, because of this isolation, Portugal develops a strong national identity, but more importantly, unlike other European powers, they're actually trading with Muslims in North Africa and in Spain. And they're able to gain access to advanced technologies for shipbuilding and navigation that only the Muslim empires in North Africa had, had access to at that time. So it gives Portugal a leg up on exploration and leaves behind the English, the French, and other uh, Western European nations. But I think there's also a natural question, right? Which is, well, what did the Portuguese think about West Africa? And again, I think this is where expectations are a bit subverted. Now, again, going back to my childhood in Georgia, my parents often told me that if a teacher ever tells you that Africa is just a bunch of uncivilized tribes and, and just small huts and that's it, tell them they're wrong. My parents were insistent and adamant in talking about how Africa and African civilizations and empires had their own proud histories. But if you rewind the clock to say 1686, the Portuguese would have told anyone else, oh, these cities in West Africa are just as advanced as those in Europe, if not more so. Um, this is an artist rendering of Benin in 1686. Hey, you notice there are a lot of people in the foreground, but in the background you have um, buildings to trade, you have churches. They're trying to make it clear that Benin is a modern cosmopolitan city. Um, also, the Portuguese found that, at least in their eyes, many West Africans had similar beliefs, um, where the Portuguese were Catholic and many of the West Africans were either of the Muslim faith or, in case the Congo Kingdom of the Catholic faith, particularly the Portuguese were action. They still had similar ideas about mysticism, to an extent witchcraft. They were ideas the Portuguese could easily understand. And again, these cross-cultural interactions go a long way towards helping the Portuguese to ingratiate themselves with peoples in the Western coast of Africa. Now, this is perhaps one of my favorite images from this era of European and African history. This gentleman here is Dom Miguel de Castro. Uh, who was an emissary from the Congo Kingdom to the Dutch Republic, sent there in 1643. Now, you notice his clothing. Um, you notice that he's wearing European dress and the like. And when he's received in the Netherlands, uh, he is received like any other ambassador. Now, this is the part where things get a bit dicey in terms of the relationship between Africa or West Africa and Western Europe. The slave trade itself does not happen overnight. Um, it is a long process, but Professor Judge actually gave us part of that process this evening. When the Spanish in particular begin to move into the Americas and the Caribbean, as they begin to enslave more and more indigenous peoples, 
those populations were quickly wiped out. Now, the Europeans are having a difficult time, on the other hand, getting folks from Europe to travel across the ocean to live in the Americas, to provide a steady source of labor. But the Portuguese, Portuguese, my friends, had already started using African labor in the 15th century in places like Madeira, uh, the Canary Islands, Cabo Verde. Um, they had some experience in trading for enslaved Africans. Now, for the Africans themselves, it's important to recognize that they did not think of themselves as African. They were thinking of themselves members of the Songhai Empire, the Mali Empire, the Mandinka tribe, etc. And so when they would have conflicts in West Africa, the result of those conflicts was more prisoners of war, bless you, who were often uh, sent to slavery. Now, the Europeans, when they first began purchasing African slaves, the Africans see it as the Europeans merely entering into already existing trade networks and trade relationships. But pretty soon, the African kingdoms are horrified to discover what's happening to the enslaved Africans. They believe that they're being treated the same way they treat their own slaves, how the prisoners of war are taken prisoner, they're enslaved for a while, they can eventually purchase their freedom, marry into a family, go on with their lives. Instead, what's happening with this system of slavery that the Europeans begin instituting in the Americas is Africans are sold into slavery across the ocean, and that's it. But they become a steady supply of labor um, for several reasons. Number one, the lack of or the collapse of the indigenous populations and the end of that, that ready made labor supply. Also, most of the Africans were seen as being non Christians. And so many European powers had this idea, this system of law that said, we cannot enslave Christians, but non Christians are fair game. Now, I mentioned before, many of the Africans who were enslaved were actually Muslim. That actually made their plight worse because of the constant wars between Christian empires in Europe, Muslim empires in North Africa and the Middle East. But again, this was a slow process. It did not happen overnight. Another reason why Africans are used is that they are seen as being less susceptible to old, war, old world diseases than their indigenous counterparts. The Africans already had exposure to uh, smallpox and diseases that were very well known in the old world. And so this was another excuse given for promoting a slave trade of African peoples. Now, I want to show you all a useful tool for understanding uh, the extent to which slavery spreads throughout um, the Western Hemisphere. And you, some of you may have heard of this before. But this is a, um, I'll pause it. So I want to show you, and I'll put this in the chat to make sure you have access to it later this week. Um, on Slate.com, there is a map that they've created that shows you the Atlantic slave trade in two minutes. So you see it starts in 1558. I want you to pay very close attention to what the map shows us. Now, each dot on the map, I'll stop to get here, is a slave ship going from Africa to its destination in the Western Hemisphere. And you notice there are only a handful, again, going back to the fact that European exploration in the Americas is starting up and they're using a largely indigenous enslaved population. But you notice by 1600, starting to pick up and Notice most of those ships are going to Brazil, South America, and the Caribbean, right? Uh, the majority of the slave Africans were sent to that part of the world. Um, a much smaller percentage comes to North America. Now, the research done into this project was pretty extensive. Some of the ships we don't have any information on, uh, but others we do. The Libya Concepcion. This ship left St. Paul de Luanda in present-day Angola with 277 enslaved people and arrived in Santo Domingo with 196. Um, that's another ship. But you see how the slave trade 
uh, begins to pick up steam. Now, each dot represents a few hundred people being transported across the Atlantic. By the end of this process, over 12 million Africans transported from Africa to the Western Hemisphere. On every ship, there are men, women, and children whose potential for growth, for development, for being writers, for being poets, for being doctors, all those things came to a sudden and abrupt end. I think it's, there we go. So you see the process intensifies. You see a few ships go towards Europe itself. We kind of leave the continent of Europe out of the slave trade, but you do have some slaves being sent to Europe directly, but the vast majority being sent to the Americas more so South America, Brazil, and the Caribbean and North America. But now you see really where the slave trade in, in, intensifies even more. Uh, I will stop on a specific year in just a moment. It starts to slow down a little bit, but then it starts to pick up steam once again. Um, you want to keep in mind that as the slave trade continues on, all the European powers, Portugal, Spain, France, England, um, they become heavily invested in the slave trade. It becomes the center of the Atlantic economy as we know it in this time period. Okay, okay. so if we stop it in the year 1776, So you see, again, so many of the ships are going towards uh, Brazil. Some are going towards North America. Um, the George. Um, this ship, a 70-ton sloop, left Senegal with 168 enslaved people and arrived in the British Caribbean with 149. It made two journeys between 1730 and 1775 and transported a total of 329 Africans. So again... Uh, we are seeing how this slave trade, despite wars in Europe, despite the Revolutionary War in North America, the slave trade is continuing to proceed of pace. Traditionally, though, when we start, we do this story about Africans in American history. This is where we start, slavery. But this evening, I didn't want to start with this. Um, and next, we will get more in depth with slavery in South Carolina itself, Stone Rebellion, and the like. But I wanted to give you a sense of what these kingdoms are, are faced with. Um, and as you can see here, the slave trade is still going on. And then it starts to slow down towards North America because the United States and Great Britain ended their slave trade participation. Uh, so most of it's going towards Brazil. Um, you do have a handful of ships going to the U.S., however, after 1808. Um, by that point, the slave trade is illegal, but as we all know, um, illicit and illegal trade never stopped anybody before. And again, this is a, a remarkable resource I often use with my students at Claflin, and it's almost impossible to get across the scale of the slave trade, but I think this comes closest to doing. When you remember that each dot represents a ship, and each ship has about 100 to 200, 300 people on it going across the Atlantic. And of course, it ends uh, in 1860. Well, the slave, slavery still continues in the U.S. until 1865, and then Brazil until 1880. So... Um, that is, again, my brief, and I do mean brief history of West Africa. Um, are there any questions? Yes, go ahead. Looking at that map, you would think that most of the slaves went to the Caribbean. You would, you would think that the Black American population would be more in the Caribbean than it is in the United States. What that map doesn't show 
is the slave ships coming from the Caribbean and the West Indies into America after the breaking process of the, of the slaves that came from Africa. Because there was a breaking process before they brought most of those slaves straight to the American shores. Right. Correct? So yeah. why didn't that map, map show the ships coming from the Caribbean and the West Indies into America to give us the real illuminating view of how many were actually brought to the American shore? Well, I think what they want to get across is the scale of the slave trade across the Atlantic Ocean. And that's what they're primarily focused on. But to your point, uh, the breaking of enslaved Africans is really important to talk about because they're being brought to the Caribbean, say Bermuda, Barbados. They're broken there and then brought further west into North America. Um, also, to your point, there's another question that we should also think about here, about population, right? Slavery, of course, is brutal all across the Americas. There's no question about it. But slavery in, say, the Caribbean and Brazil becomes particularly brutal and vicious. Uh, for example, the wealthiest colony on this map is actually this one, San Domingue, present-day Haiti. Uh, when the French lost the French Indian War in 1763, they told the British, we'll give up Canada and everything else in the Americas, just let us keep San Domingue. That's how wealthy and prosperous that colony was because it produced sugarcane. But the production of sugarcane is a particularly difficult process. And they had no qualms about allowing, really working thousands of Africans to death every single year to grow sugarcane in San Domingue. Uh, in Brazil, you have much the same system where thousands of enslaved Africans are dying every year. Now, this isn't to say that slavery in North America isn't vicious either. We're going to talk more about that next week in South Carolina in particular, with the growing of rice, tobacco, indigo, all of that. But the population in North America is able to sustain itself a bit more successfully than it is in, say, San Domingue, uh, Cuba, Jamaica, or Brazil. Uh, so that's why throughout the, the course of the map's history, you see so many ships going to South America and the Caribbean. But you're right. Um, it only shows part of the story. There's still that part of the breaking process of being exported further inland into North America. Okay. Any other questions? I'm going to check the chat. To Okay. Um, Sandy Robinson had a question. During this heavy trade with Portugal, um, were there exploitations of Africans as slaves? I'll answer your question, yes. Um, to an extent, uh, there was. Um, but that was really being done in places like Madeira, Cable Verde, and the like, with very small populations of enslaved Africans. Um, the thing is, is that when the Portuguese begin trading with, say, the Congo Kingdom, they are trading for slaves the Congo Kingdom already has. Slaves that the Congo Kingdom already had taken in combat. And they're saying, oh, you can just trade these guys for, say, weapons, for uh, clothes, that sort of thing. In fact, uh, one of the things that drives the slave trade in the Atlantic world is that the Europeans are having a difficult time finding goods the Africans actually want. For example, European clothing, the Africans really don't want. Because they're like, we're not going to wear this crap in Africa. Like, like a wool jacket? Yeah, I don't want that. Um, but when the Europeans begin to grow their, their um, presence in the Americas, they're able to trade more raw material from the Americas to Europe to produce more finished products. Many of those products are shipped to Africa with the various kingdoms in exchange for palm oil, other natural resources, and also enslaved Africans. But again, that process takes a long time. When the Portuguese begin trading for slaves, it's mostly via African intermediaries on the coastline. It's not until a bit later on when the Spanish, the English, and the French, and the Portuguese are able to better control those African ports of entry to acquire more enslaved labor. So again, it is, it is a long, long running process. Okay. Cecil, I see your hand is raised and I got you. Cecil, go ahead. I just wanted to note that chat's disabled and some people may not be able to send in questions. Thanks. 
Okay, if you're having a difficult time with the chat, just use the raise your hand function on Zoom and I'll call on you. Um, go ahead, please. Um, so earlier you mentioned that um, at first the um, African kingdoms didn't realize uh, the particular brand of slavery that uh, the Western or the European countries were going to inflict on their slaves. Um, so when did they start to realize that and like was there actually a reaction to it? Well, they began to realize this by really the late 17th, early 18th century, but the reaction was basically, well, that's too bad. Because by that point, many of the African kingdoms were deriving a lot of wealth from the slave ship. And so for some of them, while they were stunned and horrified what they had entered into, most of them are saying, well, this is keeping our kingdom afloat. It's making us wealthy, it's making us powerful. But in the long run, what's going to end up happening is that all these kingdoms in West Africa are going to collapse because of the slave trading system. It's going to cause more wars, going to cause more conflicts, 40 explicit pursuit capture more people to be sold into slavery. It disrupts the demographics of West Africa and really leaves West Africa open later on to European imperialism. In fact, one of the great ironies of this entire era of history is that by the mid 19th century, one of the European justifications for imperialism going into the interior of Africa and pulling it directly was to stop slave trade, which they had kind of started in the first place. <laughs> Gotta love his. All right. Um, okay, up next, the Charleston classroom has its hand raised. Hey, yeah, when you were um, first talking about the different things that gave Portugal a leg up, you mentioned that they actually learned a lot about shipbuilding from uh, Northern Africa. I was just wondering if you could say a little bit more about um, like what they learned and how it gave them a leg up. Well, make a long story short, uh, what they did was it gave them, they, they learned more about how to build larger, sturdier vessels that the European powers had not yet really learned how to build. Um, and this was important for the empires in North Africa because they're doing a lot of trade across the Mediterranean. They want to be able to build ships that can handle the some of the, the bad uh, terrain and weather in the Mediterranean and the like. And so the Muslim empire is some of the first to build these largest sort of vessels. They're also better at navigation. They're building tools to help them navigate the Mediterranean, which the Portuguese are using help them navigate around the coastline of Africa as well. Okay. Gwen, go ahead with your question, please. This is a question on the reading on the Stono Rebellion. Can I go ahead and ask that? Oh, sure. Go right ahead. Okay. Um, okay, so it mentioned this a little bit, but in your words, what ways did the Stono Rebellion challenge the dominant narratives of slave resistance as depicted at, by antebellum histor historians like William Gilmore Sims? And how have modern historians sought to correct and reinterpret these accounts? That's a very simple question. <laughs> All right. um, no, this is actually a really important one, though. And we're going to get into more detail with it next week, but I want to address it now. Um, for one, the Stono Rebellion, which we'll get into more detail with on next Monday, is one of the many examples of slave resistance in North America. Um, for generations, most historians in the United States argue that most enslaved Africans in North America actually either liked being enslaved or at least had no problem with it. But they, they, they would do this by basically suppressing information on these slave revolts, like the revolt in Stono, um, the revolts in New York in the early 18th century, so on and so forth. There were actually dozens, if not hundreds, of attempted slave revolts in North America in the 17th, 18th, early 19th centuries. But what Stono in particular shows is not only were enslaved Africans in South Carolina willing to resist, but they were also capable of finding ways to organize themselves to resist effectively. 
Soto Rebellion was basically a group of enslaved Africans, many of whom believed were soldiers from the Congo Kingdom who tried to make their way south to Spanish Florida because they knew that the Spanish had promised freedom to any enslaved African who came from English line. They said, we'll grant you your freedom, make you soldiers, you can protect yourselves if you help us fight the English. But what the Soto Rebellion shows, number one, is that the Africans did not like slavery. Number two, they could organize themselves to resist slavery. And number three, it almost worked. Uh, they almost made it to Florida, but they were ultimately captured and many of them were executed. Um, now, as for your second question, um, the historiography or the history of the history of slavery has changed dramatically over the last 50 years. Now, amongst Black historians like Carter G. Woodson, W.E.B. Du Bois, George Washington Williams, and others, they were talking about slave resistance well before their white counterparts, because they were willing to actually look at the primary sources and see what was right in front of them. Um, other radical white historians like Herbert Apthecker, for instance, also wrote extensively about slave revolts. In fact, Apthecker's best known work is called A History of American Negro Slave Revolts. And that was written in the 1940s. So the information was out there, but most white historians ignored it for a narrative of African subservience, a lack of, of African resistance, which simply wasn't true. And recent generations of historians have tried to correct the record as much as they can, not only by talking about large acts of resistance, but talking about everyday acts of resistance, such as the enslaved working a bit slower, breaking their tools, poisoning their masters, so on and so forth. I know we talk about not being able to use your master tools for the master's house, but some of them quite literally did that as well. Um, so I hope that that answers your question. We'll get more into that next week as well. And I see Dr. Goldman has his hand raised. Go ahead, please, Dr. Goldman. Now, I was just going to say that um, when uh, the series that I'm going to do, I, I have a whole lecture on resistance to slavery and also a whole lecture on uh, historiography uh, as it applies to African people. So uh, that may help answer some of the questions and, and or have a lot of references that I'd be more than happy to share. Let me bounce a little bit on Dr. Gallman's presentation. I, I've known Dr. Gallman since he walked in the Grove 40 years ago, and we printed things for him for his lecture series. He's been doing this around the country for a long time. And that um, the, the, the way we're going to proceed with Dr. Gallman's 10, 10 lecture series is starting after our regular four to six time. Four to six is the time that we've been doing deeper dives, we call them uh, Sunday socials before we even started the school. And they're open to the public because they're a gen general topic that's applicable to the school. So those are four to six and Dr. Gallman's series is gonna start at 6.30 to eight. Mm -hmm. And so they will be on Zoom and the people that sign up for Dr. Gallman's class will be sending out something for a sign up for the 17th. The people that sign up for that will work with Dr. Gallman in terms of moving forward and holidays and all. So we don't have a, a specific calendar that runs, but it, it will follow that Monday at 6.30 period. And you, the students, will help Dr. Gallman determine when, when the most effective is. Is that good enough for you, Dr. Gallman? Sounds good to me. All right, sir. And again, this is from the class one uh, session on our website, on our webpage. So again, it gives you the details on that March 17th date, uh, the two deeper dives there, including Dr. Goldman's deeper dive as well. All right, I think we've got time for one last question. Go ahead, please, sir. Um, earlier in the presentation, um, you kind of talked about how slavery initially started in Africa as kind of an expected war. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that's probably true for like, ancient times in Europe and all that too, but I was curious at what point was the concept of private property introduced into slavery and like, what, how, did, how were people back then talking about that? And what is, what did that mean for the, how it transformed? The, who, who's the, the property? The people that own the enslaved people, the enslaved people have the property? No, like the, the, the classification of people as property, like in the, in the, um, in the slave code you brought up. 
that is also a process that takes some time and it also becomes tied to larger questions about private property in the Western world, right? So this is one reason why there's a big debate amongst historians because we love to argue with each other about the ties between the beginnings of, of the beginnings of African slavery in the Americas and the beginnings of capitalism. This idea that uh, if you're talking about what constitutes private property in the 16th and 17th and 18th centuries, that by the 17th century, especially in, in English colonies, comes to include enslaved people. Um, and so this is actually part of, when you think about terms like life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, how it was once life, liberty, and pursuit of property, right? These are, again, major ideas that all coincide with each other. In terms of the enslaved being property, though, this is a through line in the next two classes or so, as we're talking about first the British colonization of South Carolina in more detail next week and the week after that, talking about the Constitution, and again, how that document is also designed to protect private property, which included enslaved people. So short answer to your question is around the 16th, 17th centuries, when you start seeing this tie between private property and slavery, the long answer to your question is down the next two weeks. Okay. This is this is the absolute last question. Uh, Cora Webb, please go right ahead. Mine is not a content question, more of a logistics question. Um, is it possible to make some of the um, more of the required readings printable online? Because I'm a person that it's hard for me to read like you know like 20 pages straight online. I prefer to print them out, and I, that was just a question um, for later. Okay, no, that's a good question. Well, the question was, can we make some of the online reading material more easily printable? Because some of them are, but some of them yeah. aren't. Yeah, because I um, most a lot of the ones for this first class I could find online and print offline, you know, like not on the um, actual website for the class. But there was the last reading on the bottom I could not find free online to print. Um, so I had to read most, you know, you know, try to read most of it online. Well, respond to the email that sent the, the reading out and that comes to us. And that mentions specifically a piece that you can't read. We have every every session, we have links that are gone, links that are bad. And if we don't open something and try and print it out, we may not know how legible it is. And um, I do appreciate you taking that deeper dive into those longer documents that are supplemental, but you should be able to read them. So send us a link and we can look and see what the nature of the problem is as I fix it. I think what she was talking about is like being able to like enlarge it like in a pdf is that what you're needing cora mine is not that i can't read it online i'm asking to print it oh, oh, oh and like most of the readings on the site are not printable from the site like you have to go externally on on uh -huh. the internet and find them to print them because okay. i just prefer reading them on paper but that is not a major issue. I will read them online, but I'm just mentioning that. We'll look into that. Yeah, yeah. Send, send us an example and we can sit and have the source link and we can include the source link in the PDF. Yeah, if it were if it were a full PDF, it would be easier to read, to print out. If it were actually a PDF rather than what you're scrolling through, if you could download the PDF and print from there, that would be easier. Because otherwise you're just scrolling through the pages. Technical discussion we should have to class. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we are going to find new ways to kill more trees. All right. <laughs> but that that's that's a great question. We'll try to get that straightened out right away. All right. So it it, uh, it is 829. So I know I, I see people who have their hands up, but I will say this: if you have questions, um feel free to email me um if possible. Um I'm easily reachable. Um, but we are going to go ahead and close down shop for the evening. Well, Brett, did you have any? Yeah, let's lift up the March 10th deeper dive on Sunday. Uh, Dr. Justine Hill Edwards, PhD scholar from University of Virginia, who had a book come out a few couple of years ago called The Rise of Capitalism in Colonial South Carolina. And it's really... Uh, an interesting book and an interesting study that she started with the notion it was in Barbados because that's where most of the enslaved people were moved 
almost en masse into large plantations in the Low Country that made that piece of property the most the richest in America, which gave the what would be former the soon to be South Carolina all the power that it had to affect what happened in the development of the United States of America. And so it's a really important linkage. And that um, Dr. Edwards is, is going to be in person on Zoom from uh, Virginia this uh, the 10th, which is next Sunday. And then the, the one that follows that class two the next day on the 11th is colonization through statehood. So we'll be looking at some of the things that we lift up in that aggregation of wealth and power, really driven by the enslavement of people, that helps develop the colony to help shape the nature, nature of the statehood and the nation. So these are dots we'll be connecting as we move through those dots. And for clarification, the um, event on the 10th is Zoom only or hybrid? The meeting on the 10th, is that Zoom only or hybrid? The, uh, everything that is the, that's in Columbia is here for people to come and discuss it afterwards. Uh, there, you don't have to come if you don't want to because it's all going to be on Zoom. But I, I have found over the 10 years of doing this, so the opportunity to discuss it in the class is something our friends on Zoom miss. But it's something that I found most valuable in the seven years or so before the pandemic came and we all became virtual. And so I see no reason that it won't be here uh, to be able to manipulate the, all the data and whatnot, but to give us also the opportunity to discuss it. And some of our some of our <laughs> Sunday things, there'll be human beings who are talking. What time is that on the 10th? What time on the 10th is the event? The Sunday things are, are uh, four to six. If that's is that all? I think that's well. That's just the beginning. We, yeah, <laughs> we we need to give uh, Professor Judge and and uh, Dr. Green a hand and encourage people to stay away from the Get around and ask those questions you might have and, and have a snack and get to know each other because relationships are the majority of this whole effort. We can't have a community of shared values unless we know each other. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. I'll see you next time. <laughs>